We are today following up on a series of related messages. The first one was on the difference between a reward and a gift. A gift is given without any uh, anything done in exchange to deserve it. A reward is earned. It is something you have to put out effort to receive. And so much of the Christian life, there are rewards. Salvation is not a reward, it's a gift. But there are many things that God will reward us according to what we've done. And then we look the next week at the crowns and the fact that there are five specific crowns that are mentioned as rewards in the Christian life and when we get to heaven. And uh, today we're going to look specifically at the what's called the judgment seat of Christ. In many translations, the Greek word is bima, uh, the awards ceremony, which I believe that's what it is, and I'll explain why as we look into it today. But to start with, uh, I want to kind of place it in the timeline of end time events. And so Lord help us today to catch a fresh glimpse of uh, what we can be doing in our lives to, to matter for eternity. So in the timeline, which is probably there by you, the events here are, according to my interpretation, and a lot of other people would agree with me, but I recognize there's room for, room for interpretation of others. But if you want to know what I think, this is what it is. The first thing is the rapture, which would take place, uh, I would hope, before the Great Tribulation. Others would place it mid or at the end, but uh, the fact is we are going to be taken up at some point. Uh, after that, I would place the, what we're talking about today, the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema Awards podium. Uh, then the marriage supper of the Lamb, which might be concurrent with that, followed by Armageddon, then the millennium, thousand years, then the great white throne judgment, and then the new heavens and the new earth. And next week I want to devote the entire message to the great white throne judgment. Uh, I think it's going to be one of the most important messages that I've ever preached. And uh, and so this is preparation for that, really. I want to contrast the great white throne with the judgment seat of Christ here today. So let's start out with the rapture of the church, which I might call the second coming, part one. For the Lord himself, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And what an encouraging thing it is to believe that, that uh, he is coming back for us and we will be forever with him and away from the, the burdens and pains of this world. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 51 describes it this way. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. And so that is the great... Uh, uh, awakening of those who have died in Christ uh, will be resurrected. We that are alive will be joining with them immediately in heaven. And uh, so it is a wonderful time. And I think when we get to heaven that uh, it probably won't be long before we go before the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ. And we'll talk more about that later. After that, or concurrent with it even perhaps, is the marriage supper. Of the Lamb. Uh, the wedding in Jewish uh, times, the Bible times, began with a procession to the bride's house, which was followed by a return to the house of the groom for the marriage feast. And uh, so compare that to the church, which is espoused, betrothed to Christ, now awaiting the, 
the coming when the heavenly groom will come for his bride and return to take us home to heaven and the marriage feast, which will be celebrated and it's going to last throughout eternity. So here we read in Revelation, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. We are the bride of Christ, the church, and he, of course, is the bridegroom, and this is the culmination of, of the whole book of Revelation and all that, that we have hoped for and, uh, and longed for. Verse 8 says, It was granted for her to clothe herself with a fine linen, bright and pure. Now notice, that's going to come up again later. She was granted to be clothed with fine linen. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Uh, I believe those may be bestowed at the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ. And uh, so let's continue on in verse 9. And the angel said to me, Write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so we celebrate that great time together at some point at the end of that uh, tribulation period is when it exactly happens. Uh, there's going to be a battle of Armageddon and uh, a return of the saints, a second coming part two. And leading up to that is the gathering at the a place called Armageddon, Hebrew or Revelation 16, 14 says, They are de demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Verse 11 says, Then I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. Uh, I believe that the white linen that was spoken of, given and granted to the people there in the, at the uh, marriage supper of the Lamb that they were wearing, I think that's a picture that these are going to be us, the saints uh, that are now returning. We, at the first part of the second coming, uh, we met the Lord in the clouds in the air, and now we're going back with him to the earth. Verse 19, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. For I will gather the nations. I'm going to read here in the Old Testament description of this same event. Zechariah 14:2. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses plundered, and the women raped. Half of the city shall go out into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives, that lies before Jerusalem on the east and on the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley so that one half of the mount shall be moved northward and the other half southward. Now it was from the Mount of Olives that Jesus ascended, and it's going to be there that his feet touch, and on his return it's going to split. And you shall flee to the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Aziel. And you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah the king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him and a description of what's going to happen to those nations and the people that are gathered. Step down to verse 12 of Zechariah 14. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the peoples that wage war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they are still standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets, and their tongues will rot in their mouth. Uh, and so there's not going to be an extended battle there. Uh, and that... Leads up to verse 20, and the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. 
and all the birds gorged were gorged with their flesh. The Battle of Armageddon described there, and that leads towards the millennium, chapter 20, verse 1 of Revelation. And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Just some anonymous angel that God says, hey, we go grab the devil and throw him in the pit. Uh, God's in control. Satan is on a leash. And this is just a picture of that. But uh, it says he threw him into the pit, shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a while. A millennium, meaning a thousand years. That's a word that doesn't appear in the, in the book of Revelation itself, but just the thousand year period is specifically mentioned over and over. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. And I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. And the saints that were on the earth raptured and with the Lord uh, and those that have been uh, preceded them that came out of the graves that's already happened that's in a sense part of the first resurrection but this is the completion of it here uh, and so we will talk more about the, the first resurrection and the second resurrection which I would not want to be a part of that's leading to the great white throne but uh, but this thousand year period and the people that will are resurrected there, the tribulation saints and the others that are already in heaven, and there's going to be a thousand year period, which is described in the book of Isaiah chapter 11. I believe this is talking about that. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like, a, like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It's going to be a great restoration to what it was like in the Garden of Eden. Uh, Things are so distressed now. Romans 8 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy comparing with the glory that shall be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Creation itself, the natural creation, is waiting for what's going to happen here. And a good part of that is the, the revealing of the, the sons of God here. Uh, and the earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of the Lord, and, and God's people are going to rule and reign. And there are transformations even in the natural realm. Verse 20 says, The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Uh, there were no hurricanes, no earthquakes, uh, no volcanoes in the Garden of Eden, I don't believe. And I think that's how it's going to be when Christ is reigning here for this thousand year period on the earth again. It says down to verse 22, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. The earth is groaning. And we are groaning, not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And when that happens, it's going to be a glorious thing. Our glorified bodies that aren't going to grow old and pain and weary. Uh, but, uh, but we, the Bible says uh, that we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for that, even now. I was at the bedside of a, a Christian lady at the time that she passed away. Her family was there, and, and I was there, and she had been groaning. And I, I noticed, I said to somebody in the family, I think she stopped groaning. She had passed on. She, she had died. 
Uh, and uh, what a picture that's going to be when we stop groaning on that day. Revelation 20 and verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death, which we'll talk about next week, has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Uh, so that is going to be a wonderful experience. Don't have time to go into that all today, but, uh, but then uh, there is going to be the great white throne judgment which follows after this. Uh, and we'll, uh, I want to just make the contrast today between the great, great white throne judgment, the resurrection of the unjust, of the people that have rejected God, uh, compared with the judgment seat or the bema of Christ. Acts 24, 15 says, there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. Doesn't distinguish him there, but Scripture seems to do that other way, other places. John 5, 29, For an hour is coming, when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I believe that the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ, is a resurrection of life, that the great white throne is a resurrection of judgment. 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat, the Greek word bima, of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in his body, whether good or, or evil. And Romans 14, verse 10, Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? For we, for we will all stand before the judgment seat, the bima of God. This is written to Christians when it says we will all stand. I don't think it's all of mankind, but as believers, we will all stand before the judgment seat, the bema, a Greek word of God. So what is the bema? Uh, well, it's a raised platform that decrees were issued from. Uh, government decrees was a part of that. Uh, sometimes it's in the legal context where uh, court cases are decided, but... That's probably not what's being referenced here. Uh, the bema to which Paul refers is probably the podium for awarding prizes to the competitors in athletic competitions. In our current Olympic Games, we call it the medal stand, where prizes are awarded and honor is bestowed. Paul had spoken much uh, in regard to the, the games when he was just talking about the handing out of crowns. Uh, we talked about the the Isthmian Games. Uh, Corinth was located on the Isthmus, <laughs> about a four-mile-wide strip of land that connected the mainland of, of this great, huge, what in, in effect was an island, but a huge land mass that was affected by that. And the uh, Isthmian Games were held there right at Corinth, others, uh, other places, but they all were known as the Four Games including the Olympics of that day, were called the crown games, the Stephanitic games, because the, they were all about the crown, that uh, laurel wreath that was could be placed on the head of the victor. If your name is Stephen or Stephanie, that's, and that name means crown. Uh, and may you uh, do your name proud. But uh, Paul contrasted the perishable crown that they received, which would fade and deteriorate so quickly, a crown that was just handed out by local dignitaries with, uh, with a crown that would be placed on their head that was imperishable, that would be handed and placed by God himself, the creator of the universe. And now the, the bima was the name for that podium as well as the legal uh, decree podiums. Uh, Jesus was uh, pronounced guilty and, and uh, Pilate at his judgment seat declared uh, his punishment, but uh, this is a different type of thing at the games. The judges at the games here, they, uh, they gave awards and rewards to the winners. They didn't whip or punish the people that uh, didn't finish first. And that's what I believe it's going to be at the Bema of Christ, that it's going to be not a punishment. Uh, it's going to be a place of awards, and there will be some that are not awarded others that are highly rewarded. It's not a competition between people, but as I said before, it's a competition against our old 
lazy, lustful, greedy uh, selves that, uh, that the battle really is. Uh, why do I believe that this will be a, a judgment of award and not a judgment of condemnation and, and uh, punishment? John 3, 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. When we stand before the beam of God, I don't believe it's going to be uh, a place where we are punished for our sins. Jesus was punished for us. He took the, the guilt, the curse, uh, the blame, uh, and it's not going to be held against us ever again. John 5, 24 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Notice we talked about before that it's, it's not that we're there on the basis of our works, but on basis of believing. Uh, our, our belief and believing into, not just an intellectual belief, but a, a belief that lays hold and enters into it is, uh, is what determines our eternal destiny, where you will spend eternity, not based on what you've done, but what you believe, that Jesus is the uh, Lord, that he uh, is risen, that he died for our sins. And I embrace that. Uh, the rewards come on based on how we behave after that point, according to what we've done. 1 Corinthians 4, 5 says, Therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, will disclose the purposes of the heart, and each one will receive his commendation from God. No, notice it didn't say condemnation. Uh, the judgment seat of Christ, the beam of Christ. We're not going to receive condemnation, but receive commendation from God. That's a word that means approval, uh, awards, honors, and prize. It's the highest honor. If you were to go to Edinburgh Castle in Scotland and say, I want to see the honors of Scotland, they would direct you to the crown jewels. That's when they what the the honors of Scotland are the, the jewels, the things that are placed on the head of the, the uh, people of royalty. Uh, and uh, so the, the honors that are given here, uh, every man will receive his commendation, rewards, awards, the trophies, the medals of this world are going to pale in comparison with when we, one, uh, some translations say that he will receive praise from God. God grades on the effort, not on the outward results. Uh, our crowns, our rewards are not going to be based on earthly statistics of how many people we won to the Lord necessarily or how, how much we gave in the offering or how many Bible verses we memorized, but it's going to be based on why. Why did we do that? And what, we, what did we do with what we had available? Some people have an easy time at making grades or doing good in athletic contests or whatever, but God grades on effort, uh, not just the earth's, uh, earthly measures of success. One of the great things God, uh, I, I believe, measures is, is faithfulness and obscurity. Uh, the crowns that are going to be given at the Bema of Christ, the crown of glory, the crown of victory, the crown of rejoicing, of righteousness, the crown of life, those are possible because he took a different crown of dishonor upon himself. Uh, the crown of thorns was a crown of dishonor, of humiliation. It was done to mock. Uh, John 19, 2, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple uh, purple robe. We're under a curse on this earth. Uh, uh, Genesis 3.17, And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. Thorns and thistles are part of the curse. When Jesus, when they twisted together that 
those those thorns. Uh, uh, it was, uh, I believe, a picture of the fact that the curse of this earth was being placed upon him. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. He was brutally dishonored so that we might be brightly honored. He was cursed so that we might be blessed. Uh, that's the only reason we could even be in the game and eligible to, to compete for the prizes, for the trophy, for the medals and the crowns. Uh, if you want to really get in the game, I mentioned, I think what really attracts the attention of God is faithfulness and obscurity. When you're underappreciated, disrespected, mistreated, unrecognized, you say, you know what, I'm not serving somebody else. I'm not here for the praise of men. I'm here for the praise of God. Hebrews 10, verse 32. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with suffering, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison. You joyfully accepted the plundering, plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come, and will not delay. So it was written to people who had in, in view that there were heavenly rewards that were so far beyond anything that this earth could, could offer. Uh, that there was... Don't cast away your confidence, which has great reward. There's something better and abiding, these words tell us. Take what you have and do your best and do it to please God and not expecting to get rewarded by people. He is the rewarder. I uh, listened to a message by Edmund Lutzer, the pastor of Moody uh, Church in Chicago. He was talking about the judgment seat of Christ, and he told the story of... Uh, in India, there was a, a Raja, wealthy man that was riding his chariot down the roadway and you saw a beggar standing by the side of the road. And so to the delight of the beggar, this Raja, he stopped, went over to him and uh, went up to him and reached out his hand. But instead of giving him something, he said, give me some of your rice. Well, the beggar's joy turned to outrage. What are you taken this away from me, so he pulled out one little grain of rice and put it in the hand of the Raja. And the Raja said, okay, thank you. Now would you give me another? So grudgingly and just seething with anger, the beggar took a second grain of rice, put it in his hand. And then the Raja said, okay, now can I have another one? And the beggar just infuriated, he pulled out one more grain, just threw it in the hand of the Raja, and he, he headed off. The Raja got back in his chariot and left, and as the beggar was looking at his bowl of rice, just thinking how cruel and unfair that guy had been, he saw something glistening, and he looked, and there was a little grain of gold. And he kept looking, and he found another one, and then finally a third. There were only three in the whole bowl. He realized the Raja had replaced each grain of rice he had given him with a, with a grain of gold. He said, oh, I wish I would have given him the whole bowl. <laughs> and I, I wonder when we get to heaven if we're not going to feel the same way. I wish that I would have given him everything. Uh, I, I cling to the things of this earth when they are so meaningless in comparison with the things that are eternal. Uh, and so, Father, I pray you'd help us to live our lives as people that have eternity in view and not just look into this life. I pray if there are those that say, I need to, I need to uh, come out from under the curse. Christ Jesus, you were made the curse for me and you took my sins and bore my punishment. And I believe and I receive and I respond today. That's the greatest thing of all to get in the game. But then us that are in the game. Let's live our lives in a way that's going to recognize that there's more to this life than just this life. Uh, we talk about when 
people will pass away, sometimes we, we say, well, their coronation day has come. They passed on to heaven to receive their rewards. I've kind of adjusted my thinking on that. I don't think it's happened yet. I think that's going to happen at the Bema seat, at the, the judgment seat, the awards of ceremony of Christ. I think that's coronation day. So when I get home to heaven, I want to see Jesus. And I have an idea where I might, found him, might find him. I uh, adapt a little song that you might recognize. Sweet home at the Bema. I hope I earn a crown or two. When I stand there at the Bema, I want to hear well done from you. When my work on earth is ended, Lord, I'm coming.